Here are five lore details from the Arkham games. Please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 100k this year. I'm going to keep begging every video until it happens. Follow me on Twitter as well. And let's get started with the first one here. The Court of Owls. One of the biggest Batman villain groups, and surprisingly, they never make an appearance in the Arkham games. They aren't a mission, Batman and his team never bring them up. It's almost strange. It makes you wonder if they ever fought the Court of Owls in this universe. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But one thing that is seemingly true is that the Court does exist in the Arkhamverse. Seemingly. If you don't know, the Court of Owls are a group of some of Gotham's oldest and wealthiest families that use extreme violence and money to wield political influence throughout Gotham's history. They've been around since the 1600s in Gotham lore. They have these undead ninja things called Talons that go out and do their dirty work for them. These Talons in some versions are vicious dude, like a few of these guys can kill Batman in some versions, they're very dangerous. Anyways. The only references we get to the Court of Owls is in Batman Arkham Origins. At the Gotham Royal Hotel when you're fighting Bane outside the building, you can see these statues here. These statues are straight up talons. This is their design. It's pretty crazy. Maybe the hotel is run by the court? Who knows? And the other easter egg we get for the Court of Owls is during the Firefly segment in this area here under the bridge. You can read this poem which reads, the Court of Owls watches, watches all the time, ruling Gotham from shadowed perch behind granite and lime. They watch you at your hearth, they watch you in your bed, speak not a whispered word of them, or they'll send the talon for your head. This is the Court of Owls nursery rhyme. So this shows that the court does exist, or not, maybe it's all just coincidences and rhymes. But it's also possible Batman may have fought them in between Arkham games. I mean, even though they're never mentioned whatsoever, that doesn't mean they don't exist, right? And honestly, I've never been a fan of the Court of Owls, really. I just don't like politics in general, and their stories are heavily based around that, so it's hard for me to be invested. I prefer singular focus villains like Two-Face, Killer Croc, those kind of people, for example. But I digress. It's just interesting that Rock City themselves never referenced the court, but WB Montreal in this game does. Maybe we will get an Arkham prequel with them in it. It could be really interesting. But yes, if I had a guess, I do believe the Court of Owls do exist in the Arkham games. Going back to Batman Arkham Origins, Black Mask quote unquote hired eight assassins to kill Batman. However, if you look around Sionis Industries, there's files that show rejected assassins that Black Mask tried contacting. It's either that Black Mask rejected them, or the assassins themselves rejected his offer. I think it's the latter because these assassins I'm about to show you are much more reliable than Electrocutioner. Okay, so there's three files for different assassins. The first one here is Cheshire. You can find it where you find Black Mask locked in Sionis Industries. Cheshire is a really ruthless assassin and is also a Teen Titans villain. She often appears in Teen Titans stories. She's also often seen as a love interest to Roy Harper aka Arsenal. If you watch Young Justice, they showcase that there. The next one you can find here is David Kane. Now David Kane is an interesting one. He's also pretty much an assassin. He kind of reminds me of Cable. Anyways, he's really interesting because usually David Kane actually trains Bruce Wayne before he becomes Batman. In some iterations anyway. Did he train Batman in this universe? No idea. There's no reference to it. But also another fun fact about him, his daughter is Cassandra Kane. Cassandra Kane becomes Batgirl in the general Batman mythos, which is interesting. We never see that in the Arkham games though. And the last one you see here is Black Spider. Black Spider is, spoiler, another assassin in DC universe. You do see him in the Arkham tie-in movie Batman Assault on Arkham who, for like a C-lister villain, he gives Batman a pretty good run for his money when they fight in that movie. He pretty much just has an advanced suit with advanced technology, coupled with his amazing acrobatic and combat skills. I like to think they all rejected Black Mask's offer to kill Batman, but let's say Sionis rejected them instead. What would the reasoning be? There was a comment on an old short I made talking about this where someone answers that on their own educated guess. As you can see here, Cheshire being too young and experienced, David Kang not as strong as Slade and doesn't work well with Shiva, and Black Spider is more of a vigilante type and could align himself with Batman. Pretty good guesses and I honestly agree with it, and it's interesting that they were considered. It would have been cool to see these guys, especially David Kane, 
due to his lore with Batman, maybe one day we can see these characters in the Arkham Universe. What happened to Bane after Arkham City? Now, I think a lot of people may know about this one just because I feel a lot of people talk about it and it's a riddle in Arkham Knight, so this one's easier to learn about, but I wanted to talk about it because it's interesting and I want to re-explore it with some new thoughts. So in Arkham Knight, in these crates over at the docks, you'll find his gear. Scanning it reveals what happened to Bane. It tells us that after Arkham City, Bane wanted to go find Solus, a way to make the nightmares and pain he constantly experiences to stop. If you didn't know, Bane has nightmares about a demonic bat for most of his childhood, and it seemingly still lingers into his adult life, and it's a big reason as to why he goes after Batman. So in order to try and remedy his situation, he actually left Gotham after Arkham City and went back to his home, Santa Prisca, but when he got to Santa Prisca, he realized how much of a hellhole it still is. It explains in the story how he saw a kid dying from a gunshot wound with the kid's mother at his side. Bane realized just how corrupt Santa Priest is, as it was being led by cartels and drug lords amped up on Venom in his absence. The corruption was constantly killing a ton of innocent people, so Bane took it upon himself to fix things and fight against the cartel and restore peace back to Santa Prisca. The story reveals that Bane killed and beheaded 12 drug lords and lined their heads up on the beach. He must have been a fan of Alpha from The Walking Dead. The last thing we hear is that he goes after his final target, Peñadura which is the place Bane was actually raised in, and Peñadura is a hellhole as well, don't get it twisted. Now this is very interesting, I wish we saw this. What I like to think is that this is the Bane that we see in Arkham Origins, the perfect Bane, factually, it's not an opinion, that's factually the best Bane ever. And I like to think that Bane after Arkham City starts to get his senses back, maybe becomes smarter again and more like the Bane from Arkham Origins after Arkham City. Because I hated the one that we saw in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City where it made him pretty much look like an idiot, which isn't the case with Bane. Maybe after Arkham City, he's starting to get some of his intelligence back and fights against the corruption, because him taking down the cartels here would probably take some of that intelligence. But it's such an interesting and badass ending for Bane in the Arkham games. Like, from villain to hero kind of thing, right? Bane left Gotham, which itself has corrupted like no other, only to come back to somewhere else just as corrupted. Bane, for those that don't know, has a soft spot at times. He's shown to have glimmers of good in him, helping and saving kids, for example. Seeing that kid die must have woke him up, and seeing him pretty much become the Batman of Santa Prisca is just so badass. It's like his nightmare is the demon Batman, which he sees as Batman, but now he's using Batman's influence to execute his own justice. It's a really interesting story here, and yeah, I hope he becomes intelligent again, and that's what I'm going with because Bane and Arkham Origins was just masterful. But yeah, awesome detail. I wish we could see more of this Bane. It looks like Bane becomes the Batman of Santa Prisca. In Batman Arkham Origins, you can find postcards from an old love interest to Bruce Wayne, Andrea Belmont. Andrea Belmont, for those that don't know, was in the Batman Mask of the Phantasm animated movie. In that movie, spoiler alert, it shows that Andrea was a love interest to Bruce as he just started crime fighting in Gotham. It's an amazing movie and I recommend watching it and I'm going to be spoiling it here like I said so keep that in mind. Here are what the two postcards say. So context, in the movie, it's about this grim reaper murderer that is the phantasm that goes around killing people. The killer turns out to be Andrea Belmont and her father in the movie embezzled money from a higher up and was forced to escape to Europe. The end of the movie shows Andrea leaving Gotham on a boat leaving her and Batman on depressing terms because she was a murderer, she can't be with Batman. Here's a clip of me buying a Captain America shield signed by Chris Evans and Samuel L. Jackson. Wait, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to eat off of it. <laughs> Cook the meat on it. This is not about us. This is, this is Gotham Paladin's moment. Now, I bring the ending of the movie up because these postcards insinuate something different from the movie. 
The postcards here, as you can see, are like happy. Like she's telling Bruce to contact her, whereas in the movie, she was a murderer and escaped Gotham without telling Bruce. So perhaps in this universe, she was never the phantasm. It was just a love interest to Bruce's and just trying to look for her father. I don't know, maybe I am getting it wrong, but in the movie, she leaves Gotham depressed and not in this happy tone that we see here. So I feel her story is different in this universe, but nonetheless, it's a really cool secret in the game. And it also confirms that Andrea Belmont happened in this universe and she may have been the phantasm, maybe not. Either way, this is a really cool detail exploring Bruce's past. So in Arkham Knight, Two-Face has different dialogue if you capture him before and after the main story of the game. I think him and Penguin are the only ones with different dialogue in this sense. Maybe other villains too that I'm just not remembering, but yeah, anyways. I wanted to talk about this detail because I think Harvey has some of the most interesting dialogue in these particular scenes that highlights his character and Batman's character. Listen to this dialogue before you beat the main story. Settle down, Dent. Don't call me that. He's dead. I don't believe that. I wish I was dead. I'm a freak because of you. That wasn't my fault. You're the man who put that acid-throwing bastard in the dark. You said we'd save Gotham. I'm sorry, Harvey. So, if you didn't know, this dialogue references the time where Batman, Harvey, and Gordon work together to take down the mob, and in doing so, Sal Maroney, one of the mob bosses, throws a vial of acid at Harvey's face during a trial, turning him into Two-Face. I covered this whole thing in my long Halloween video, go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. But yeah, what I love about this dialogue is that it shows how depressed Harvey still is even after all those years. He feels betrayed by the people he likely trusted the most during that time. Batman told him they'd save Gotham, but to him, all that happened was that he lost to Gotham's corruption while the others left him. And what I love the most about this dialogue is that you can hear when Two-Face is talking and when Harvey is talking. Two-Face was the one saying that Batman was the reason the vial of acid hit him, but you can hear Harvey Dent when he tells Batman that he told them that they saved Gotham, showing his depression. Batman does apologize, but it's really sad to see. It goes to show how Gotham spawns its own criminals and sometimes it turns the best of Gotham into the most deadly. It's why Two-Face is my favorite villain. There's a ton of layers to the character and he has such an interesting personal relationship with Batman that you can't condone his actions, but you can understand where he's coming from. But let's go ahead and take a look at the dialogue if you capture him after the main story where the whole world knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman. <sighs> Damn you. So is it true? Bruce? <laughs> Don't answer them. We know the truth. You aren't Bruce Wayne. Jim Gordon and I, we didn't strike a deal with Bruce Wayne. And it's sure as hell not Bruce Wayne waiting on the rooftops each night. This is who you are. See? We get it, Bruce. It's not the face you're given. It's the face you choose. Now this is one of my favorite conversations in the game. Now this dialogue points to the hammered down notion that Bruce Wayne is a mask and Batman is his true self. You hear this everywhere, right, if you're a Batman fan. It gets annoying sometimes, but it's really interesting when an actual in-lore Batman character touches on it. What I love the most about this dialogue is that it's Harvey of all people talking about it and it makes the most sense since the whole double-faced stick is his thing. He knew immediately that Bruce Wayne is a facade and Batman is his true self. And I love that's Harvey telling him that he and Gordon didn't strike a deal with Bruce Wayne, and Two-Face saying it's not Bruce Wayne jumping off the rooftops each night. That was all Batman. The final quote of him saying it's not the face you're given, but the face you choose, is so spot on as well. Bruce was given the face of Bruce Wayne, but he chooses the face of Batman. It correlates with Two-Face as sometimes, like this dialogue here, he chooses which face to talk to Batman with. Harvey speaks to him as a friend, while Two-Face speaks to him as an enemy. It's just so interesting and what makes it even more interesting is that Batman doesn't say a single word to Harvey in the scene. It's like Batman knows that Harvey understands him completely at this point and just lets him do all the talking. These conversations are very interesting and it's a huge shame because Two-Face has so much interesting story to explore 
but we never get to see that in the Arkham games fully fleshed out. Maybe a long Halloween prequel can do that, but as it stands, that has yet to be seen. But yeah, those are five lore details in the Arkham games. I love these particular ones growing up with the game, so this was a lot of fun to make. Let me know if I got anything wrong or if there's something you wanted to add, and leave a comment on what your favorite one was. As always, leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe to help me get to 100k this year, please, please, I'd really appreciate it. Follow me on Twitter as well, and any support in the video is always really appreciated. Thanks so much for everything, truly. I have swag. Stay safe, and uh, peace.